Good afternoon for everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here and it's a great chance for, for us to discuss our ongoing work on the concept of semi-periphery and uh, the idea of financialization conceptualized in, the, in this way. Our work that we've been doing till now builds on previous work uh, from me, Anna, and, uh, and Juan on the concept of the uh, semi-peripheral uh, financialization. And what we aim here is two different things. On, one, on the one hand, uh, the idea of having a theoretical framework that helps us to understand the post troika context here in, in Portugal, and having Portugal as a case study to study financialization to give, to give some kind of contribution, theoretical contribution to the financialization uh, literature. So I start with some, some of, the, of the things that we, we heard uh, this morning. Financialization has now been a, a concept that has colonized very different uh, social sciences and has very different meanings across social science and even within uh, political, uh, political economy. I'm not going, through, going, going to, to map the different meanings of financialization. I will just start on how we understand this process and how we think Portugal can be helpful to further to further conceptualize uh, the, uh, this process. So uh, we see financialization, as we, uh, we've seen in the morning, as variegated. What does that mean? Financialization depends on the history, geography, and institutional path of each country, its, each uh, region, and most, most importantly in this uh, debate on different sectors, of different systems of provision. The way that uh, finance intertwines production is different, not only uh, in different countries, but also within each country in different uh, seasons of provision. Some of the work that we have done yeah, has been published here <coughs> in Portugal on the, sector, on the housing sector, the water sector, pensions, uh, has been, have been some of the case studies that we have uh, scrutinized in this, in this context. What we add here in, in theoretical terms to this uh, literature is to stress the international, the international <coughs> financial hierarchy and how there is structural power and within the international financial uh, sphere that constrains national economies and, uh, and different uh, sectors. Thus we use the, the term semi-peripheral uh, financialization aiming at, at capturing not only the uneven and combined nature of this process <coughs> in different sectors, different countries, but also uh, these international power relations that uh, give uh, its specificity in different uh, geographical uh, contexts. And here we go, uh, I should say, we go beyond, beyond the idea of a monetary hierarchy. Of course, that's very important, important in, the, in, in the literature on the subordinate financialization, the idea of the role of the dollar, the role of the euro, and the Portuguese economy as an, a member of the European Monetary Union. But not only that, but the, all the institutional framework that goes along with that uh, monetary hierarchy. I'm saying international institutions such as the World Bank, IMF, and of course here in, in Europe, the European Union, the, uh, the ECB. So the idea here of semi peripheral uh, financialization is not so much to place the semi periphery in the world systems or dependency uh, theory literature as as having this, um, as the semi-periphery having a role, a particular role in the international economy, 
but more as an hybrid economy that shares both features from the core and from the, <coughs> the periphery. I'm going, this is the, our, all our previous work, I'm going to just give you uh, an overview. Some of the features that we share with the uh, more peripheral uh, uh, economies are the dependence of foreign capital inflows in the form of bank credit, the persistent re relevance of banks and not so much financial or security, uh, securities markets, and the way this credit was allocated to specific sectors of the economy. Real estate, in the case of Portugal, in other, in other countries, the stock, the stock market. Uh, so it was the availability of this uh, of this capital was very much uh, uh, direction to to specific uh, sectors. However, belonging to the European Monetary Union and the privilege of having a, an a, an hard currency as the the national currency, in this case the euro provided these countries, not only Portugal, with very low interest rates, no need for reserve accumulation. So contrary to what happens in other peripheral countries that has to accumulate reserves in order to have an insurance policy uh, in case of capital flight, here we don't, we don't need because we, we don't need these reserves because we belong to the same monetary, uh, monetary union and all of that allows Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy to have levels of yeah, external indebtedness that are not matched by a, n no peripheral country. So, still today, when we talk about most indebted countries in the world, we are talking about the southern uh, uh, periphery. However, what happened in Portugal uh, and uh, the southern uh, periphery during this, uh, this period was very much similar to what happens in peripheral countries when they have current account uh, crisis. With uh, the exception of uh, the dev devaluation of the, the currency, what's ha what is happening now, for example, in uh, Latin America, we had almost the same process of having an externally imposed agenda, in this case by the European Union and the, the, IMF, uh, the IMF, of fiscal austerity, privatizations, labor market, product mar market uh, reform. So the standard uh, structural adjustment processes that, are, <coughs> that were common and still are common in, uh, in peripheral uh, countries. In the case of the southern uh, European uh, countries, not only they had to go through this memorandum of uh, adjustment, but the European Union reinforced their power structures and their, their grip over uh, these peripheral countries. Today, the vigilance and uh, the power that the uh, European Union has over, for example, our national budget is much stronger than it was. Ten, uh, 10 years ago. And going through this crisis and adjustment, adjustment uh, process, and this political grip that now uh, the European institutions have uh, over the periphery, helped to explain what is different in this case compared to other peripheral countries, which was the, the turn on monetary policy by the Euro European Central Bank in 2014, 15, when they started to lose their monetary policy, particularly through uh, the quantitative uh, easing uh, process, which is something that peripheral, peripheral, peripheral countries don't have available to, to them. So what that meant for the Portuguese and other southern European economies was less debt service, so the state now spends less on interest, on interest than, than it did a few years ago, and a small debt uh, restructuring. Uh, uh, this is something that is not very discussed here in Portugal, but the way uh, the ECB buys public debt through the Bank of Portugal, that then gives dividends to, to the state, 
in, in practice is a, a, a small reduction of the public debt uh, burden, which is very relevant if we want to discuss the, the, the last four years of economic recovery with the new uh, government. On the other hand, on a more European uh, scale, with this loose mon mon monetary policy of, of liquidity, availability at very cheap prices, there is this interna international search for yield, for the new uh, investment uh, recipients across, across the world, but particularly in Europe, where there is no currency risk with, with these countries. So we have a return of the capital inflows that characterized the whole path, <coughs> financialized, financialized path of the Portuguese economy till, uh, till the crisis. So what do we have now uh, here in Portugal during the past four or five, uh, five years? We did have uh, economic recovery with mild, with small economic growth, but a very strong, uh, I would say, uh, surprising drop of the unemployment rate. Uh, in 2013 we reached 16% of unemployment and now it's around 6%. 6 per, uh, 6 what does explain this uh, recovery? I have pointed to some of the external conditions that uh, that had uh, a strong influence. I should add on that uh, external influences the European economic recovery, so the external demand growth that of course helped the, the recovery here in Portugal, but also domestic factors such as the new government and the slowdown, at least the slow, I, I won't say reversal of uh, austerity, but slowdown of uh, austerity, especially tar the way uh, the measures that targeted public uh, public sector workers and uh, and pensioners. On the other hand, we know that public investment reached record low low, low levels during the this period, which has translated to degrading public services, especially health and uh, education. Nonetheless, this slowdown of austerity, of course, helped. The, the recovery that we are still living in, in this country. A more structural factor was the tourist, touristic um, boom of the past uh, few, few years. We have some structural factors here, all the turmoil <coughs> in the Middle East and Northern Africa, so there was a change of pattern of tour, uh, uh, touristic uh, flows from those countries to the European, uh, to, this, uh, to the southern uh, European countries, and things like the rise of the low-cost carriers, all were structural factors that explain the the growth that we have been living uh, throughout the past four years with annual growth uh, growth rates of ten and uh, ten percent. And I must say something that I think help this touristic boom is the, the effect of the labor market reform. So we have this boom, but that, doesn't, that didn't translate into higher wages or better working conditions, in, particularly in this sector of, uh, of tourism, much thanks to, to the labor market reform that, uh, that, uh, that we went through during the adjust, adjustment uh, period. So in some ways, I think, the structural adjustment process was <coughs> successful in its own terms of devaluing labor in, uh, in, in Portugal. And finally, well, this, tour this touristic uh, growth is very much concentrated around the urban, the big urban centers, Lisbon, Porto, a bit less so in, uh, in the Algarve, and that translated to this new model, new, new business model for tourism called Airbnbization, which has annual growth of 60%. If I'm not mistaken, Portugal is now the seventh market for Airbnb worldwide, which given the, the size of our country is quite, quite uh, uh, impressive. So, what 
did this land to. Fooled by uh, this tu touristic uh, boom, we, we now have a real estate, a real estate bubble going, going through very much concentrated in, uh, in the large uh, uh, cities of Lisbon uh, and, and, Port and Porto, and that has been fostered by, basically by foreign funds. So it's not the domestic bank credit that fueled real estate during the 90s and the 90s, but what has changed uh, dramatically here is new agents, have entered, new financial agents have entered the, the real estate uh, Portuguese uh, market, particularly investment funds, real estate investment uh, trusts, hedge funds, have Case of Lone Star and, uh, and Apollo, that also benefit, benefited from the dire state of the Portuguese banking uh, system uh, during these years till this moment. Even today, we've seen the news that, that uh, uh, the biggest uh, private bank in Portugal is still being uh, restructured by. <coughs> Public, public, uh, public funding, and in general, every bank here in Portugal have in their portfolio no, non-performing loans, much above the the European uh, uh, average. So that's one of the structural changes, financial flows. What kind of agents we are facing uh, now, and the way that translates to real estate is itself quite different. What we had before, with the rise of household indebtedness through mortgages, was a more or less symmetric process across the across Portugal. Cities like Coimbra would benefit from that uh, credit boom of the 90s and 90s, and and the, uh, the construction sector during that uh, that, that period it, it boomed. In this, uh, this period that we are now analyzing, it's very much concentrated in the city centers where we have uh, tourists. So we have passed from a, a reality that still persists of oversupply of housing. Many of the medium-sized uh, cities still are still plagued with oversupply. <coughs> My own city, Viseu. Uh, case, case point uh, uh, of that, with a relative high scarcity of housing in the city centers, in the Lisbon and Porto uh, city centers. So we see, uh, again, uh, we could uh, elaborate on that, on an even and combined uh, development of this new phase of uh, financialization uh, here in Portugal. And of course, even on average, it, and I must stress this, this is an average for Portugal. Housing prices have risen from 27% uh, <coughs> in real terms from 2013 to 2017. Of course, there is an argument that we can make here that the Portuguese market was undervalued uh, because of the effects of, of, the, of the crisis. But of course, this has direct consequences on uh, social reproduction. Here, I'm taking social reproduction in the narrower sense of the reproduction of the labor, so uh, labor force. So, of, of course, it is articulated with economic capital uh, reproduction, but what we meant to stress here is how, in a period of economic growth, of low unemployment, the social vulnerability of the Portuguese workforce uh, right, rose uh, during the, this period. Of course, on top of the list we have the evolution of the, the rental market and how renting today and house in, uh, in Lisbon or, or Porto is, uh, is almost impossible for someone that has an average, uh, an average pay. How public services have been affected by this ongoing and under public uh, 
uh, invest, uh, an investment. And of course, as I was saying, the effects of the labor market reform on the labor market, where even with this growth of uh, uh, employment, we don't see an, ev an evolution of the wages that can go along, that should go along with the drop of, uh, of uh, the unemployment uh, uh, rate. So not only we have more precarious relations when it comes to first jobs, youth uh, employment, but even new permanent contracts, uh, the average pay, pay did, uh, did drop in, uh, in Portugal. And well, I think one of the indicators of this strain of social reproduction here in Portugal in, in terms of labor force is how even with this growth and drop of unemployment, we still have massive immigration. I, I could point a particular case for of that, but, uh, <laughs> but how the fluxes of immigration uh, are today still very much higher than they were before uh, the, uh, the crisis. Of course, what that has been happening is with the type of jobs that are being created in these non-qualified uh, sectors of construction <coughs> and tourism, we have at the same time a strong inflow of migrants coming to work uh, in, these, uh, in, these, in this sector. And of course, when we are talking about precarious relations of um, uh, employment, degraded public services and difficulty in the access of housing, of course the effects are not uh, symmetric across uh, not only classes but of course women and ethnic minorities which are in the case of Portugal very much concentrated in Lisbon in, in, and uh, Porto are much more affected by this general uh, Social uh, vulnerability. And I'm no, <laughs> oh, I'm I'm missing a slide here. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. No, 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 no. Uh, no. Ah. There, there, uh, I, I, I had some more points to, <laughs> uh, to make to, just to doing my, my my presentation. What we are facing now in this new period of SMIP peripheral financialization, what, what is our argument <coughs> is that this concept not only could explain what happened before the, the crisis, but help us to understand what's happening uh, now and the, the changing nature of this SMIP peripheralization. Why? Because what we see now is how the peripheral character of the Portuguese economy has been reinforced. How? When? The, how the economic structure has been changing, going towards, I would, I would say, a peripheral model of labor-intensive <laughs> services and sectors has been the backbone of the Portuguese uh, economy, tourism, uh, industry, uh, industry, construction. First. The second is how we are inserted in the international financial uh, sphere, no, no longer with the intermediation of a national banking sector, but directly to capital inflows in out and outflows, which of course enhance the Portuguese, the, our external vulnerability to the appetites of the, uh, of the financial uh, sphere. So we lost degrees of autonomy in the way our financial sector uh, behaves. On top of that, we have this project of the European Union of a Banking Union, which of course aims to create big European banks. To, and that, that's something that we can witness here in Portugal when we see the Portuguese banks being bought by foreign, uh, foreign capital in the case, and with a very specific, but I, I think illustrative case of how Santander is a sponsored uh, European bank to become one of the major players at the European, uh, in the European context, and how that goes along with the fact that they bought, for example, here in Portugal, uh, Banif. 
So this project of the European, uh, European Banking Union implies big European banks and that excludes the existence of some kind of national financial system that could give some support and, and finish it. Give some su support to, um, to the external uh, volatility of the international uh, financial sphere. So when we have a higher vulnerability to the external conditions now, because remember, Portugal still is one of the most indebted countries in the world, and two, the social conditions that we are now facing of degraded public service, <coughs> labor, uh, precarious labor uh, relations, enhance the social vulnerability of the Portuguese people towards, uh, we don't know when, but the next crisis. We are worse prepared to, to the next crisis than we, we were in 2010 in, I would say, any way that we want to think about it. From public policy to social strength to, to tackle such a, 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 a social crisis. So, I, with this positive note, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did my presentation. Thank you very much.